After the basic characterization, the next step is to create similar exposure groups. And so now we are moving into the diamond in the AIHA strategy flow diagram. And if we have an exploded view of this diamond, you can see that within the exposure assessment, there are several tasks, and we'll talk about each one of these rectangles in the diamond. The first thing and the most important task during exposure assessment is to establish the similar exposure groups that we have talked at length in previous lectures. And the reason for creating these SEGs is straightforward. It's a matter of being efficient. And the idea is that we consider the exposure of a few people within each exposure group to be representative of everyone in the group. And this allows limited resources to be better used to characterize the many exposures that are available in the workplace. All of the information that we gathered during the basic characterization about the workplace and the workforce and the work agents, these all come into play when we create an SEG. And so in this Venn diagram, we can see an overlap of these three different circles. The first one corresponding to the workers or the people with different job titles and classes and descriptions. And then you have the work processes and tasks. And then the third one are the chemical, physical, and biological agents. And an SEG is essentially grouping workers into what are called similar groups on the basis of these three categories. We have discussed the various methods for establishing SEGs. You know, we have discussed the observational method, which is where we create an SEG by examining the activities that workers perform and a judgment on the expected similarity. And this is done before any monitoring measurements are made. And so exposure samples are not necessary for this. And the second technique for creating SEGs is solely relying on sampling data and using statistical approaches to determine SEGs. And we have discussed the pros and cons of each one of these two approaches. In terms of establishing SEGs by observation, there are a variety of ways in which we can do that. And as I have mentioned earlier, a lot of this depends on the professional judgment of the industrial hygienist. So it can be a somewhat subjective process. You could create an SEG on the basis of the environmental agent and the process, or agent, process, and job, or agent, process, job, and task, or any of these combinations. And you could also look at work teams, or you can look at non-repetitive versus repetitive work. I'm going to give you a couple of different examples of how SEGs might be created. Again, we are looking at a particular nickel operation in a plant called Falcon Bridge in Canada for the time period 1950 to 2000. So the first column in this table, we are looking at just the job location. And if you look at the first category, it's the job location is in the mill part of the workplace. And within that, there are four different groups doing different tasks. So the first task group is called a feeder man secondary crushing plant. And that is within the mill. And there are other similar groups within the mill. And then the third column here is the time period. The location, the task they're performing, and the time period together define a similar exposure group. The time period is very important because most plants are continually changing in their nature and in the way there might be new technologies being introduced, and so that might affect the exposure levels. In the second column, we have these different types of tasks, pellet plant operator, SFD plant operator, center plant operator, and so on. And under the blast furnace, we have a furnace feeder man. And so this is for a time period 1950 to 1978. But in 1978, they went from a blast furnace to an electric furnace. And so the nature of exposure has changed. And so now we, for the period 1978 to 2000, we don't have the blast furnace anymore. We have 
something called a roaster and an electric furnace. And so the exposure groupings change with changing technology in the workplace. Now, in this slide, I'm showing not a mining operation, but a more high-tech research and development lab. And in this case, there are 25 departments within which there are 410 job titles and there are 10 major functions. And these functions are shown in the rectangular box on the right-hand side. As you can see, the names of these functions are not particularly useful. It's a chemical R&D lab within a company. And so they are engaged in developing new chemicals and then testing them and so on. So the titles of these functions are called synthesis and applications and so on. Not particularly useful, but we go and talk to the company personnel and we understand what each of those job titles do and which major function they are engaged in, and most importantly, which chemicals they are dealing with. And so on the basis of our interviews and our sort of very detailed analysis of the written job descriptions and the tasks and the projects that they were engaged in, we can arrive at 77 similar exposure groups. So here's an example of where the job title is not very helpful and a major function is not very helpful. And so it's a more time-consuming process where we depend on interviews with people. It is also important to understand the different determinants of exposure, the types of control measures that are in place and their efficiencies. So for example, a canopy hood versus a lab hood, the frequency and duration of the exposure the distance of the worker from the source, the size of openings and the surface areas of the exposed agent. And you may want to know also the chemical and physical properties of the agent itself. What is the surface area of the agent? For example, if you are interested in the exposure of workers to nanometer sized particles, you may be interested in their surface area. But if you're interested in exposure of larger sized, uh, micrometer sized particles, then the surface area may not be as important. If you're looking at very volatile solvents, then you may be interested in their vapor hazard index. And the composition, of course, is very important because we need to know what is the most important chemical from a toxicity standpoint in a product with many chemicals in them. The quantity of the agent being handled, the absorption rate onto the skin or through the inhalation route, and the application method. These are all important parameters to understand. In the next lecture, I'll be talking about how we use these determinants of exposure to assess exposures. And so I'm just going to have the slide here, but there'll be a whole lecture on this topic later on. So as we have discussed earlier, when we establish similar exposure groups by observation, there is a potential for misclassification, and this has been studied and described in the scientific literature. And the reasons for misclassification are that we don't have thorough information when we are going purely by subjective observation. The creation of the SEGs depends on the training and experience of the industrial hygienist, and in situations where individual work practices cause most of the variability, an observational approach may not be the best way to do it. So two workers who are both doing welding, for example, observationally might look very similar because you observe both of them just doing welding. But one of them might be a rookie welder while the second person might have been welding for five or 10 years. So their exposures might be quite different and that would not be captured by the observational method. And then we have the sampling method, which is more objective because it relies more on actual measurements and the statistical analysis of the measurements using the analysis of variance as we studied in previous lectures. And here, the sampling precedes the grouping of the workers into SEGs. As we have discussed before, the sampling approach requires a large number of samples for statistical analysis, 
and does not allow for any flexibility for prioritizing SEGs. And quantitative measurements are very expensive, so this approach is not necessarily very feasible most of the time. 